you have your Bibles, open them to uh, the, the epistle of 1 John. That's not the Gospel of John. Head, to, head towards the end of the Bible. Matter of fact, you can go to Revelation and back up to Jude and then back up to 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, and you'll be there. 1 John chapter number 5. We've been in this series called The Gospel is Good News. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news. And it is good news if you know Jesus Christ. If, 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 it, if you don't know Jesus Christ, it means the, the news that you missed. I mean, you, and, and that's, a, that's a bad day. Matter of fact, that day lasts throughout all of eternity if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. But it, isn't it grateful that he made it possible that if you so choose to have everlasting life, you may? Amen? And I think that's a wonderful thing. And we need to know that, that God loves us, and we need to know that our uh, eternity is secure in him. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bible, would you stand with us in honor of reading God's Word? In 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 13, the Word of God says this, These things... I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, once again we come needing you, Lord. We need to hear a word from you. Lord, you've provided everything that we need. you provided salvation full and free. It's paid for. It's done. But, Lord, it needs to become personal. Father, you've created us and you've given us life. You've watched over us from the holy throne in heaven. You know every thought that we have, good or bad. You know them all. And, Lord, you know the sin that separates. But, Lord, you made a way. You made a bridge. You made a possibility. But, Lord, uh, we must believe and we must trust. We must commit our life to you. And Lord, I don't know the salvation extent in all the lives of the people that are here or the ones that are watching online. But Lord, I pray that once again that you would speak to us personally. Father, may the message be clear from you so that you can speak truth into us and draw us close. May your will be done. Lord, give us another miracle by your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. John told us three reasons why he wrote this epistle. And I think we need to know them all. In the first chapter, he said the very first thing in the, in the first chapter, in the fourth verse, he said, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. He said, I'm writing you these things so that, that you can have joy. It's his joy. But not just have joy. Listen to me. He wants you to have joy that is full. And that is the state that he wants to live, us, live our life in. And he came, and he's writing this letter so that we may not miss out on it at all. Look in the second chapter. He gives us the second reason in the first verse. He says, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. We were saved from sin. We were forgiven from sin. But God doesn't want us living in sin. God wants us to, he wants to give us victory over sin in our life. And there should never be a time in our life that we are under the, the command of the habitual sin in our life. He said, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. And the third one, we read in chapter 5, verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That word know means beyond a shadow of a doubt. It means absolute certainty. It's not a I think so, I hope so. That's not what he's talking about. When it comes to your eternal destiny, when it comes to your relationship with God, he says, I want you to know for certain that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ. There's some things you don't want to miss out on. There's some things you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he says, the word of God 
will tell you. The Word of God will let you know. You can rely on this. And as a matter of fact, this third test is extremely important. I call it the acid test. I mean, everything relies upon that. It's kind of like a lie detector. When you look at these three things, that your joy may be full, that you do not sin, and that you know that you have your life in him because you believe in him, it's like a lie detector. It's like John is just hooking us up to his lie detector, listening to the Holy Spirit of God. As you listen to this message, you're either going to hear a ding. I mean, that's such a pleasant sound. And God says, amen. And you'll feel good, and you'll hear the nice little ding. I should have had you up here, Mark, with a little key. But what you don't want to hear is the eh. The buzzer going off. I said that in the first service. I don't know what people online are thinking when they hear me do that. I probably have people just jumping back and falling off. You don't want to hear that. Nobody likes the, 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 the sirens that go off. Maybe you do want to hear that if you need to hear that. You don't want to hold to something that's faulty. You don't want to hold to something that's wrong. On something that is as important as your salvation, something that is important as your eternal life, you want to know that you know that you know that you know that you know that it is settled. Now listen, all these three things are, are given in the positive, but they can also be inverted. He said, I've written this thing to you, that, you may, your, that your joy may be full, but it's also saying your joy might not be full. I have written these things to you that you do not sin, but maybe you are living in habitual sin. I'm writing these things to you so that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may have eternal life in Him, but maybe the buzzer will go off and will tell you you are not believing. You don't have eternal life. I think we should put it to the test. I think we need to know that we need to know. We need to know that God is actually working in our life. It is reliable. We can trust in him. We need to hear the whisper of God. I believe and I know the whisper of God. I've heard it for the last 50 years that I've been saved. And I also remember what it was like when I did not know Christ as my Savior. I knew the Word of God. I knew the Bibles, uh, all the books of the Bible. I had been to church. I knew what the disciples had did in their, done in their life. I knew all of those things. As a matter of fact, I was a fairly good student of the Word of God when I was 10 years old. But yet I knew that I had sinned, and my spirit knew that I was lost. And I remember the day that I gave my heart and life to Christ, I felt like I was going to explode under the conviction that was upon me. And it was a decision that I had to make. Praise God, I did. And my life has never been the same. When Jesus saved my soul, I love this word. You've heard me say it many times. He saved me to the uttermost, and he saved me forevermore. And I'm not, I'm not standing on how good I am, but in the gracious gift of God. I think we need to know that. We need to hear him. Now, here's something that's very important before I talk about each of these three individually. When John wrote these three things, that your joy may be full, that you do not sin, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God, he wrote them in the present tense. Now, salvation is an action in your life that has continual results. It's not just something that happened for 30 seconds in your life and you, you got things right there and then you went on and just lived your life however you wanted to and maybe you went to church a few times, maybe you gave a few dollars, maybe you were baptized, signed a card, maybe you uh, did something that the church asked you to do. That's not what it is. Salvation is a one-time decision, listen to me now, it is a one-time decision that has continual active results in your life. And if that is not happening, 
Don't, don't just go back, and, and it bothers me when someone says, oh, years ago, I've gotten to the place where I want, I, I want to say, is, are you currently believing God for your salvation? I don't want them just to say, well, 50 years ago, in my case, 50 years ago, I trusted Christ. What God wants to know is, am I still trusting Christ? Because if it was real then, come on, it's real today. If he, if he born me again then, then I'm born again today. If he placed life within me then, then that same life is living within me today. This is an eternal decision, and I think you'll agree with me in saying it's extremely important. It's something that we need to know that we need to know that we need to know. It's a life with continuing results. So let's look at the first one here, and we're going to look at it that your joy may be full. You know, there's things in life that can happen to you that can steal your joy. The Bible calls this, the religious word is righteousness. But I, I kind of like to call it our behavior. Look in chapter 2 in verse number 3. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 3. And by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, is he saying that we've got to go back and keep the Ten Commandments? Well, that'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? But what about all the other things, all the other teachings of Christ to love him with uh, the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself? That's, the, that's what the, uh, the, the thing that we should do. That should be a great barometer. But I think there's a whole lot that God is leading us to do in our life. Literally, it means this. Are you listening? Are you doing the will of God? Are you following the will of God? Are you letting your life be about what the Spirit is leading you to do where you daily have an opportunity to say yes to Him and no to yourself and to the world and to the circumstances or situations? Are you actively following the will of God? Look what it says. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I'm glad that's God's word and not my word. That's pretty strong right there, isn't it? I mean, does anybody like to be called a liar? But if you are a liar, you need to know it. And if you're believing in something that's false, wouldn't it be great to know that it's false so that you can repent of it and change? He says, he says, if you say, I know him, come on. But as James said, if there's not corresponding actions in your life, something's wrong. If you say that he is your Savior and Lord, then you should be following the will of your Savior and Lord in your life. Look what it says in verse number five. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. If we're abiding in him, that means that we are living with him. And if we're walking with him, that means we're on a journey with him. That means he's going to lead us where he is taking us. He will guide us every step of the way. He will tell us what to do along the way. We will have his wisdom. We will have his instruction. And then he is expecting us to do what we should do or to do what he is doing. We've got him right here with us. We've got the perfect example of it. So we know what he wants us to do. All we have to do is just that little bitty thing, obey. That's either an oh no or an obey. And it's so easy, but it can be so hard. Because once again, it's either his will that we're following or another will. If we're following his will and we're walking with him, if we're having conversation, if we're having life with him, if we're on this journey, I think where he is, it will be full of joy. Amen? 
Oh, that was weak. Come on, church. If Jesus Christ were here today, would we have fun? Amen. I think the singing would be good, Brother Mark. I know the preaching would be good because it'd be him. Amen? Right? I mean, it would be a good day if Jesus were here. And, and whatever he was leading us in, whatever he was going to teach us about, our hearts would be full of the joy of Christ. Amen? That you may know. He said, I'm writing this to you that your joy may be full. You're following a different path other than Christ's path. It may not be a very delightful path. Matter of fact, it may be a very hard path. But come on. As hard, as hard as the walk to Calvary was, Jesus never lost his joy. Being in the will of God, walking in the will of God, walking with his anointing and and, and with the blessings that come from him, there is nothing like it in all of life. Now, by the way, this does not mean sinless perfection. Amen? You got any perfect people in, inside? Raise your hand if you're perfect. Good. I mean, we'd ask y'all to leave if you's perfect, right? No perfect people allowed inside. Only perfect people in heaven. Amen? As long as we're down here, God's working on us. Look, look what I, I like this word here. He says in verse number five, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected, completed. It is a progress work. I may not be what I need to be, but praise God I'm not who I used to be, and I'm working towards. I'm daily obedient. I'm daily letting God build me up, progress me in this great work. What a wonderful, exciting walk it is to know Christ. Let's talk about the second test. This is in chapter 2 as well, and it's the test of love. Look what it says in verse number 9. I'll see what it says too when I turn my page. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. He who says, by the way, you'll see that phrase over and over again in the book of 1 John. It says, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. You're not going to stumble if you're walking in the light. You're only going to stumble if you're walking in dark. And he says, if you have the light of God in you, you have the love of God in you. This is agape love. It's not phileo. Phileo means I'm fond of. But agape means I cherish. And I cherish to the place that I put it above myself. So when we have the love of God, that love is supreme over everything else. And we live our life, we walk our path in the light of his love. Look what it says in verse number 11. He who hates his brother is in darkness. It's either love, light, or darkness. Hate is a strong word. But if you don't love like Jesus, we're coming up short. Come on now. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength. Y'all good with that? Amen. And love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And I'm here to tell you, that's a whole lot of love. That's a whole lot of love. Look what he says there in verse number 11. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Look in chapter 3, verse number 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Look in verse number 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us 
commandment. His commandment is that we love one another. Look in chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Look in verse number 11 there of chapter 4. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected, perfected, completed, made mature. His love finds its purpose and end when we are loving others. Love is a choice. It's easy to love those that love you, right? It's easy to love those that are doing good for you. But what do you do with those that do not? It's amazing to me. It's a miracle to me that all that they did with Christ never changed the way he viewed them. It's a miracle that all that I have done to my father has not changed how my father views me. He hasn't given up on me. He's given me another chance and another chance and another chance. And he's allowed me to fall on my face and has been there to lovingly help me up. But yet there are people in this world who are not living by God's cherished, placing them above themselves, but are walking in what they think love is. If you're good to me, I'll be good to you. If you're evil to me, I'll be evil to you. And, and they feel so justified in it. Well, you don't know what they did to me, or I, I have a right to judge them, or I have a right to look down upon them, or I have a right to say that about them. I have those people who call it righteous indignation, and that makes them feel justified that they can just bless somebody else and just give it to them in Jesus' name. By the way, Jesus never did that, and his spirit will never do that. His spirit will speak truth, I love it that when God talks, it's described as a whisper, not a scream. It's encouragement. I love it that he, when he calls us to himself, he doesn't say, you dirty, rotten sinner. He woos us with love to himself. So should we be. So should we be. We are to be people that seek to bear witness of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will always lead us to love. Satan will lead you otherwise. Satan will always be about division. You've heard me say that a thousand times, and you'll hear me say it another thousand times. He always wants to divide us. He always wants to pit one against the other. But God's never there. God always loved. God always wants to bring together. So let me just ask you, whose side are you on? Who's influencing you? What fruit is it bearing in our life? Remember, these are written in the present tense. Is there anyone right now that you have a problem with? Is there anyone right now that if they walk in the door, you duck? You're going down the street and they're on one sidewalk and you want to duck into a store or cross over to the other side of the street? Or Is there anyone that if you just hear their name, your blood pressure goes up? Come on, listen. Is there anyone that when you hear or think about them, the first thing that you think of is something negative or something harmful or something hurtful? I will tell you there's an area in your life that God wants and desires and needs to work. Look in chapter 4. I want you to see this. I, I, I kind of cut it short earlier. Look in verse number 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love God does not know God for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Did the choir not do a great job just seeing this? 
Are you grateful for John 3.16? John is the same guy who's writing this, and he's really quoting himself. He's saying this is the thing that God did for us. He loved us. Look at verse 10. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment, the, the, the satisfaction of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Look what it says in verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God is in him. Just remember this, folks. This is not an emo- emotion, it's a choice. I don't care what you've been through. <laughs> if we only loved when our emotions were on high, we wouldn't love very much, would we? But it's easy to love Bradley when they love you. It's easy to bless others when they're blessing you. But when they curse you, when they gossip and they lie, when, when, they, when they're trying to be harmful and hurtful, and yet in your spirit, come on now, you say, that's all right, I choose the love of Christ. I choose to love in the name of Jesus. That goes back to that first thing. When you're walking with Christ and you're in, in, in abiding with him and, and you're acting as he acts in the will of God and you're loving the way he loves, your joy will be full no matter circumstances at all. Now let's look at the last one. Let's look at the last one. Here's the third test. I said it's the acid test. John 15, 5, 13 says that, that we may know. Look what it says in John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You know, there's some times when we just need the Word of God to be simple. I mean, just straightforward and simple. Let's look at that verse again, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten by him. Look at verse number four. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Say it with me. Our faith. Let me read it again. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the acid test. Now, church, listen to me. There are times when my behavior is not what it should be. There are times when my love is not what it should be. But there should never be a time, no matter the circumstances, when my faith is not in Christ. Now, if my faith is on me, I might mess up. And there may be times that I don't feel very righteous, and there may be times I don't feel very worthy. There are times that I feel like, why? God just made a mistake. Surely God wouldn't love me. Surely God wouldn't save me. But trust me, it's not about my emotion. It's about his will. The Bible says in Romans, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, y'all know the next three words? Shall be, say it loud. Amen. Doesn't say might be. If you call on the Lord, if you believe and you trust, and you, you ask him to do for you what only he can do, you're born of God. Here's the key, faith. Now, my problem with this is this. We t- I, I know what Ephesians 2.8 says, for by grace have you been saved through faith, yet not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, but that almost sounds religious. Oh, do you have faith? Yes, pastor, I have faith. Oh, really? I think sometimes we need to just call it what it is. It also uses the word 
believe. Do you believe? Yes, pastor, I do. Okay. Maybe we should say it something like this. Are you trusting him? It means the same thing. Are you relying upon him? It means the same thing. Have you committed yourself to him? Because saying it and not living it, two different things. Remember that phrase that I told you you're, you're here all the way through the book of 1 John? He who says... He keeps saying it over and over again because I think the old aged uh, Apostle John in his 90s as he writes this is looking back and he said, there's a lot of people who are talking to talk, but they're not living it. Are you committing your life to Christ? Are you trusting today or are you trusting in yourself? I think that there are more people who are trusting and relying on their 401k and Social Security than they are in Jesus. They're, they're more trusting in the doctor and what the doctor says than what Jesus says. They're more trusting in what the world thinks and being approved of by the world than worried about what heaven thinks and being amen by my Lord and Savior. What are you relying on? Oh, Manly Beasley, the great evangelist that blessed my socks off so many times. I still listen to him online. He's been gone for a long time. He died in 1991, just a, a few days before my son was born. I'll never forget him. He used to say, what are you trusting God for that if God doesn't come through, you're sunk? We talk a lot about living by faith. What are you doing in your life that if God doesn't come through, you don't have a hope and a prayer? What are you doing in your life that you're living in such a way that, that the only hope that you have is your commitment? Is God coming through? Is your relying upon him? There's a lot of people say, I believe. Really? This is the acid test. Hear this and hear this well. The existence of faith is the evidence of your salvation. Just belief. It doesn't have to be perfect belief. Just belief. I got saved when I was 10. My oldest brother, who's now in heaven, got saved when he was six. People have come to me and they say, Preacher, do you believe a six-year-old can get saved? I believe if a six-year-old knows that they have sinned and they believe in him and they believe that God sent his son and died on the cross for their sins, he was a perfect person, but he rose from the dead to give them life. And if they pray and invite the Lord into their heart and life and they give their heart and life to him, they're just as saved as I am. Now, I want to make sure when I talk to a six-year-old or a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old, by the way, or a 29-year-old, or a 69-year-old, I want to know. I want to look in their eyes. I want to hear. But all you got to do is believe. Let's just be very positive about this. He says to them, this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. He who is, uh, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The evidence Excuse me, the existence of your faith is the evidence of your salvation. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I think one of my problems, Brother Lance, is this. I think there's a lot of people who are just have an intellectual assent. They got it in their head. They go to church, and mom and daddy took them to church, and the preacher says that there is a heaven, and Jesus is the Son of God, so they just accept that as it is, and it's like intellectual assent. I believe George Washington was the first president of the United States. I never seen him. Bradley, did you see him? Oh, okay. I didn't know. 
<laughs> but I still believe it. Intellectually, I believe it, but I, I'm, I'm fine with that. When I was in school, they taught us some things. How many of you remember A squared plus B squared equals C squared? Well, some of you have a blank look on your face. I'm not too sure. You know, I took algebra. I took algebra two. I took algebra. I took all the ones I could take, all the ones they offered in high school and college. But listen to me. There's not too much in my everyday life where I'm going around saying, hmm, this is the perfect application for A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, I know it to be true. It doesn't really affect my life. I wonder how many people are saying, well, of course I believe in Jesus. But they don't mean that any more than they believe that George Washington was the first president. Well, of course I believe that. If you ask the question today, in we, we live in the Bible Belt, right? If you ask them that they believe that there is a heaven and that Jesus is Savior, the majority of people still today, over 70% will say, yes, they believe in that. By the way, the percentage is down. Over 20 points down in the last 20 years. But people, the majority of people still in the South, the, the, the statistics are that they still say that they believe in heaven and they believe that Jesus is the way. Where are they? I mean, how many conversations have you had walking through your life where people have just come up talking to you about Jesus because he is the most important thing in their life and they're, they're just living their life for him and they're trusting in him and relying upon him and, and they just have a, a, a great glory of God in their life. Their joy is overflowing and they just can't help but share what Christ has done with them. Have y'all seen those people? Few. Not as many people as maybe profess it. It bothers me about those people who only have an intellectual assent. But listen to me, church, if it's real, it's real. If it's faith that is real, it's faith that lasts. I got up this morning early, a little after three, and uh, went to the living room. It was pretty dark. Look, we have a couch that faces the bay window. And I had my Bible, praying. I got to this, and I was thinking about this, and I looked out the bay window, and I saw the moon. How many of y'all seen the moon? You can raise your hand on that. <clears throat> we have a half moon right now. So the light was shining on it to where I could see half the moon, but I still knew that all the moon was there. Though I only had enough light to see half of it, I still knew all of it was there. Still believed all of it was there, though I could only see half of it. I said, Lord, that's good. I might use that. I waited a few minutes, drank another sip of coffee. Isn't that what you're supposed to do at 3.30 in the morning is drink coffee? And the clouds came over. I couldn't see it anymore, but I still knew it was there. There are times in life that you're walking on the amount of light that God lets you have, but you still know all of it is there. And the circumstances may cloud it all together where you don't see it, but it's still know that he is God, he is Savior, he is Lord, he's at the right hand of the Father, he is watching over you, he loves you with an everlasting love, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. A cloud may come, but it can't take away what God has placed in your heart. There are a lot of people that are talking about faith. They're just not living it. There's a lot of people who want to say, I trust God, but not really. Have you ever seen a Christian, when something comes up, 
a hardship comes up in their life, they just fall apart. Have you ever seen a Christian that something comes up in their life and they face it? It's not easy. <laughs> Pretty doggone difficult. And yet, they know God's got it. And they know that they're in the hands of a loving God who will take care of them every step of the way. Doesn't mean it's easy. But that's what we have in Christ. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. Timothy said, Paul said it well to Timothy. I pray the Holy Spirit saying it well to you. Now hear me, and I close. You may know the name. You may be thinking about something that happened 30 years ago or 50 years ago. But if it was real 50 years ago, it'll be alive today. These were written in the present tense. So let me ask you, are you believing today? Are you trusting today? Are you loving today? Where is your walk? Where's your joy? Are you hearing the ding of the Holy Spirit's comfort? Or do you hear the buzzer of the Holy Spirit saying, this is not right, but we can make it right? The hardest thing for me as a pastor is to see someone who knows the truth but yet does not want to turn and yield to the truth. I don't mean to be rude when I say this, but it doesn't matter how much God loves. He loves completely. That's a fact. What matters is how much you accept his love and not reject his love. It doesn't matter that he died on the cross. He died on the cross for everyone or anyone. But yet, he can only be the Savior for the one who chooses to receive, who chooses to believe, and to give their heart and life. That's the difference. It really doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what you've been through. Do you know that 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 you're saved? The gospel is good news if you know Jesus.